Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel, Lemon Grove. Thank you. Let's bow our heads together. Father, we come before you this morning thanking you, Lord, for this roof over our head, the word that we have before us. Pray, Lord, that you would open us to your word today, ears to hear, and a mind to understand what you have for us, Lord. We love you. Lift this time to you now. We ask your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. You'll join us in standing. We'll worship our Lord together. Okay.
and justice. To you, O Lord, I will sing praises. I will behave wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when will you come to me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. A perverse heart shall depart from me. I will not know wickedness. Whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him I will destroy. The one who has a haughty look and a proud heart, him I will not endure. My eyes shall be on the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He who walks in a perfect way, he shall serve me. He who works deceit shall not dwell within my house. He who tells lies shall not continue in my presence. Early I will destroy all the wicked of the land, that I may cut off all the evildoers from the city of the Lord. Thank you, Michael. All right, and now uh, the worship team is going to play one more song. Um, and by the way, worship is not a spectator sport. We put the words up on the screen, so go ahead and sing along. And um, 
If you would like to support the Lord's work through your tithes and offerings, there is an agape box in the hallway. You can take advantage of that while the worship team is playing this song. God bless you. We've got a, a great study ahead of us this morning. We're in 1 Timothy chapter 2. So if you want to start turning there, that's where we'll be today for, for our study. As we were saying last week, the book of 1 Timothy basically divides itself into two sections. Chapters 1 through 3 address charges to the church, while chapters 4 through 6 deal with charges to the Christian. So the first three chapters deal with charges to the church corporately. Uh, the final three chapters deal with Christians individually. Now, as you know, uh, Paul, I mean, uh, Timothy was much younger than the Apostle Paul. Uh, he looked up to Paul. He traveled with Paul. He was Paul's protege. I like that word, protege. Um, anyway, Paul just developed this deep trust in Timothy. You know, it was, it was developed over time. And in chapter 1, Paul referred to Timothy as a like-minded man. Timothy had the same heart as Paul. He was on the same wavelength as Paul. 
And in this epistle, Paul was writing to his young protege, this young pastor, Timothy, and he gave directions related to the church. <coughs> First and Second Timothy and Titus, as we have said before, were often referred to as the pastoral epistles. Timothy and Titus were both pastors, you see. Paul wrote to these young pastors about the ministry. And if you desire to serve the Lord in whatever capacity, you would do well to study these books, uh, to regularly read them, because they provide a lot of useful and very practical guidance for us. Now, in chapter 1, we saw the charge that relates to the, to the church as it relates to doctrine. We looked at Paul's command to Timothy that he should not allow other stuff to be taught. Paul urged Timothy not to go off on tangents. And specifically those dealing with genealogies, fables, other kinds of esoteric would-be truths. Keep it basic, keep it simple, keep it focused, Timothy. That was, that was Paul's message to him. Now when we get to Paul's second letter to Timothy, we will see Paul telling Timothy, the things that you've heard from me when I was teaching many, you teach others the exact same things. They will in turn pass those truths on to the people that they're discipling. So chapter 1 relates Paul's charge concerning doctrine. Chapter 2 relates Paul's charge concerning devotion. In verses 1 through 8, Paul is going to talk about the practice of worship within the church. And then in verses 9 through 15, the place of women in the church. First, the practice of worship. Paul is zeroing in on two things as he writes to this young pastor. These principles apply to our church as well. We are to be telling God about people, and then we're to be telling people about God. So verses 1 through 3 discuss telling God about people and prayer. We're also to be telling people about God, you know, the teaching, the instruction. We're going to get into some stuff er tough areas as we study this chapter. So just stay with me, okay? I promise it has a good ending. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore I exhort or encourage, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, First of all, does not refer to time. It's not a chronological category. It refers to importance. What comes next, then, is of first importance in Paul's heart and mind. The broader context is Christian public worship. So Paul begins a series of instructions for those meetings. First and foremost, we are to be people of prayer. Paul mentions here in... 1 Timothy, the various forms of prayer that we are to offer for all people. Now, supplication means asking for something. Our prayer should not consist solely of a laundry list of things that we want God to do for us, but we should ask in bold confidence from God's word. That's a privilege that he has made available to us. Prayers is a broad word that refers to all communications with the Lord. Intercessions are the requests we make on others' behalf. As we pray, others' needs should find a place in our prayers before God's throne. Last but not least, giving of thanks. It's an essential part of our walk with the Lord. And those who lack a sense of gratitude in their lives lack a basic Christian virtue. That last phrase, all men, tells us for whom we are to pray using these various means of prayer. Do all of us need prayer? I'm sure you probably wouldn't argue with me too much about that. You've never met someone that you can't or shouldn't pray for. Most of us find it easy to pray for our family, our friends, our loved ones, but it shouldn't end there. We should also pray for our enemies, for those with whom we have conflict. We should pray for those who annoy us and for those who seem to be against us. We should pray for our friends who need to know Jesus. We should pray for our co-workers and others with whom we have regular contact. We should pray for our pastors. We should pray for our church. 
We should pray for other ministries that we know and love. And we can find something for which we can thank God in everyone. Even those who persecute us and those who are, you know, against us. They have a place in God's overarching plan. We are also to pray, verse 2, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence or dignity. This is one of those tough areas that I was alluding to earlier. Paul says that Christians are to pray for public officials. Now, as you know, we do not live in a monarchy, and thank God for that. We do not have an earthly king in the United States. To bring this up to date, he's saying that Democrats ought to pray for Republicans, and that Republicans ought to pray for Democrats. Many years ago, a visitor asked a famous Senate chaplain, do you pray for the senators? The chaplain replied, no, I look at the senators and then I pray for the country. <laughs> And that's what Paul is telling us to do. We need to pray for our country, and we need to pray for those who have authority over us. We are to pray for kings and even for presidents, because they're in positions of, of authority by the predetermined counsel of God. Now that's easier said than done at times, isn't it? Under the guise of a would-be pandemic, our government, which is supposed to be of, by, and for the people, has made a massive power grab. They seek to deprive us, the people, who they are ostensibly there to serve, of our most basic rights. Mm -hmm. Rights that we used to take for granted. The, De the Declaration of Independence confirms that the rights we have were not given to us by the government. They were given to us by God. And the government does not have the right to take them away under any circumstances. Now, all that is bad enough. But over the last few weeks, we have witnessed the complete disintegration of our nation's foreign policy. And that disintegration has consigned the nation of Afghanistan to its most bitter fate. I am stunned by the way our would-be leaders have abandoned that country and its people. I am shocked by the way our government has bungled our withdrawal and surrendered hundreds of billions of dollars worth of sophisticated weaponry and equipment to the Taliban. I am outraged that our remaining forces and the Afghans who supported our efforts for the last 20 years have been subjected to a murderous terrorist attack at the Kabul airport. I'm not gonna let that tiger too much further out of the cage, but what should our response be to all that? Paul says we are to pray for those who rule over us. You might ask, are we to pray even when the government is a corrupt one? The answer is yes, especially when it's a corrupt one. Paul is telling us to pray for whoever is in power, and his words were not idle. Remember who was in power as Paul wrote this epistle. It was the bloody Emperor Nero. That offers us some great context, I think. Going back a few decades before that, it's no wonder that Caesar Augustus decreed that all the world should be taxed in Luke chapter 2. He was, after all, Caesar Augustus. Caesar, the august one. Caesar, the highest. Now, wait just a minute. Was, you know, while Caesar Augustus was breaking his campaign promises and raising taxes. What was really going on? What was the deal? Well, a young virgin named Mary was carrying the Messiah in her womb. She resided in Nazareth. Hundreds of years previously, the prophet Micah had declared that Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. That's in Micah chapter 5. Therefore, Joseph and Mary set out on a difficult and dangerous journey from Nazareth in the north to Bethlehem in the south. They did not, so, they did not do so uh, in response to an edict from Caesar, the august one, but in obedience to God, the almighty one. 
The scripture says that the king's heart is in the Lord's hand, and he moves it wherever he wishes. If you want to have an impact on the heart of the king or the president or the Senate majority leader or the Speaker of the House, pray for them. Pray that God will open their eyes. Pray that God will give them wisdom. Pray that God will make them statesmen and not politicians. That's what we need. Well, what if we looked at politics today believing that it is God who is truly on the throne? Because he is. Wouldn't that be a radical concept for Christians? Yes, we have a responsibility to pray and to make supplications, but we are also to give thanks for all, no matter what side of the political spectrum they might represent. All rulers are used by God to fulfill prophecy and ultimately to accomplish his will, whether they know it or not. Now, the purpose of those prayers is that we might lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness. The real purpose of the government, believe it or not, is not to tax people. The real purpose of government is to preserve the good. All laws should be designed for the preservation of good because there are those evil influences and powers. Government, you know, is actually ordained for the purpose of preserving the good, keeping out the evil, and when a government is no longer fulfilling that function, the evil they allow will ultimately destroy that government. And if you look real closely at today's headlines, you'll see we might just be right on the verge of that right now. Study your history books. You'll see that it's true. Over and over and over again. Most governments began with the high ideal of preserving the good but in time, corrupt forces moved in. Laws were liberalized to the point where good was no longer being preserved. Evil was allowed, tolerated, and then protected by the laws. The next thing after that was that the evil then overthrew that government. We are at that stage here in the United States. We have been there for some time now. Evil is now being protected. It is being mandated by law. Protection of evil is actually being mandated by our laws. The next state is the fall of that government. So we really need to pray. We need to pray for kings and all who are in authority, even when we don't feel like it. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men, to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Many people have an opposite picture of God. They look at him as one who wants to damn everybody. In fact, they go around asking for him to do so. That's what led to the idea that so many have in their minds that of God judging and condemning everyone. That is completely opposite to the truth of God's nature. He would have everyone to be saved as this verse clearly states. Listen to God's heart crying to the people through the prophet Ezekiel. As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Peter said, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Paul tells us that God desires that all people would be saved. He is the God of salvation who desires that all people should be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. You might be asking, what is truth? Verse 5, here it is. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. The Romans worshipped many gods. And things haven't changed over time, have they? Today, people worship many different gods in a different sort of way. People give themselves over to many things. Some to pleasure, some to entertainment, some to possessions, and so on. For example, the entertainment world has become a religion of sorts for many people. There are women who would sacrifice their virtue in a moment, men who would sacrifice their honor 
In order to become a movie, television, or even a YouTube star, people have many different gods today, but there is only one God, and he is the creator. Now, in Old Testament times, the Israelite would go to the temple, where there were many priests. He could go to God through them. Paul is saying there's only one mediator to whom we are to go. You remember how Job was beset by afflictions. Here's a few of them. He lost his possessions. He lost his children. He lost his health. He was lying in misery covered with boils from head to foot. He was lying in the ashes. And then his wife looked at him and that miserable state and said, Honey, why don't you just curse God and die? Get it over with. I can't stand to see you suffer like this. His friends came to visit him. They were supposed to comfort him, but rather than comforting him, they became accusers, condemners. One of his friends named Eliphaz said, why don't you just get right with God and everything will be okay? And Job said, thanks a lot, pal. What do you mean get right with God? Who am I that I could stand before God and justify my case? I go out, I look up at the stars, and I realize how vast and how great God is. And here I am, just a nothing here on this planet. God is so great, and I am so small. I try to find him. I look here, I look there, I look around. I know he's around here, but I don't see him. How could I stand before God to declare my innocence or to justify my case? God is vast, I'm nothing. There is no mediator between us who can lay his hand on us both. Job saw the problem of man trying to touch God, to communicate with him. He realized it's trying to bridge the gulf between infinity, infinity and the finite. The only way Job could see it happening was through a mediator who could touch both. In answer to Job's cry, Paul said, there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Through Jesus Christ, Job's cry is answered. He is the mediator who can touch God and touch man. For he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. And he became flesh, and he dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. There is one God and one mediator between God and him, the man Christ Jesus. And you might be wondering, what does that mean exactly? It means that if you want to come to God, don't come to me. I'm not a mediator between God and you. If you want to come to God, you must go to Jesus Christ. He alone is the mediator between God and man. You can't go to another person. You can't go to the saints. You can't go to Mary. There is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. He is the only one who can bring you in touch with God. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, John chapter 14. There is no other way to approach God. Now that's a very radical, exclusive claim, isn't it? One God, one mediator, the man Christ Jesus. But thank God, there is a mediator. And oh, how thankful I am that I came to God. I can come to him. Jesus stands there and puts his hand upon God. But he also reaches down and puts his hand upon me. He brings me in touch with God. I touch God through him. He was in the form of God and did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. And yet, he came in the likeness of man that he might touch me. Philippians chapter 2. God touched man through Jesus Christ. In turn, man can touch God through Jesus Christ. One God, one mediator. Verse 6, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. You see, we were all sinners. 
as a sinner, I was totally unable to redeem myself. There was nothing I could do to save myself. There was nothing I could do to make myself righteous. There is nothing I can do to atone for my past guilt. You might say that there are high sinners and low sinners, that are good sinners and bad sinners, but you're all sinners. It doesn't matter if you're a good sinner or a bad sinner. None of us can redeem ourselves. But Jesus gave himself as the ransom. He died for us. He died in our place. Isn't that remarkable? Take a few moments sometime and just think about that. Think about the depth and the breadth of what he did for you. And if you were the only sinner that walked the face of the earth, he would have done it for you. That's how much he loves you. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 7. For which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am speaking the truth in Christ and not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. So Paul says, I have truly been called to share with people, to pray with people, and so have you. Verse 8, Therefore I desire that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands, without wrath and doubting. It's interesting that when the Bible talks about prayer, we see people raising their hands, lying prostrate on their faces, lifting up their eyes and standing. What we don't see in Scripture concerning prayer is someone folding their hands and closing their eyes. Yet that's precisely how we teach our kids to pray, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I know why we do this. Every parent does. If your kid's eyes are closed and their hands are folded, they're not getting into trouble. <laughs> now, now that we are adults, though, we should realize that there's great liberty in prayer. Sometimes I find myself prostrate before the Lord in times of intense prayer or worship. I also love to pray when I'm out for a walk or a run. You can pray out loud while you're walking and that'll help you to stay focused. You might wanna not do it when you're around somebody else because they're gonna think something's wrong. But um, I would encourage you to explore different postures of prayer. And remember, it's not the position of the body that matters. It's the attitude of the heart. Verse nine. In like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing. So Paul has given the way that men ought to pray, and now he tells us how women are to pray. And although we live in a culture that no longer blushes, the godly woman is embarrassed by immodesty. There are fashions and styles that are designed to be sexually provocative. And I do, believe, do not believe that Christian women should wear such styles. Jesus said, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. That's in Matthew chapter five. Thus, to wear a style of clothing that would display, display your body so as to create a lust or a desire, you may be causing a man to sin. You don't want to do that. Wear modest apparel. The braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing that Paul mentions were adornments that went against the principles of propriety and moderation in that culture. You see, how you dress reflects your heart. If a man dresses in a casual manner, it says something about his attitude. If a woman dresses in an immodest manner, it says something about her heart. Verse 10, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. So the most important adornment you can have, you can put on, is good works. If a woman is dressed in propriety and moderation with good works, she is perfectly dressed. God, you know, good works make a woman more beautiful than good jewelry does. The beauty of the countenance of a woman who is walking with the Lord is something that is to be desired. It is truly glorious to behold. Verse 11, let a woman learn in silence with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. Now, there are certain things that I wish that Paul had not written. Uh, take note of something here. 
Paul is prohibiting, Paul is prohibiting the woman to teach or to usurp authority over the man. That would be as it relates to spiritual things and spiritual issues. Yet in writing to Titus, Paul said, let the older women teach the younger women. There is a place of teaching for women, teaching of the younger women, how to love their husbands, how to keep their homes, how to walk in godliness, righteousness. Well, that was the calling that Kay Smith had at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, to teach the younger women. She taught a, a study called The Joyful Life. And after she had raised her family and had been freed from the obligation of having young children at home, she was free to share with the younger women the secrets that she had learned in walking with God and seeking to raise a godly family. Paul mentions to Timothy how he had been taught in the scriptures by his mother and his grandmother. The teaching of the children was largely the responsibility of the mothers. The only thing prohibited here is the teaching of men and usurping authority over them in spiritual things. That's the only thing Paul was prohibiting here. He was not prohibiting a woman from sharing with men. Years ago, when we were living in Honolulu, we attended a, a seminar that was taught by Anne Graham Lotz. And I, there are very few teachers I've heard that are as anointed as Anne Graham Lotz is. And in fact, Billy Graham used to say that Anne Graham Lotz was the best preacher in their family. In writing to the Corinthians, Paul mentioned the women praying or prophesying in a public assembly, and he did not come down on them for that. He did not prohibit that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 3, Paul writes, He who prophesies speaks edification and ex exhortation and comfort to men. I see these as areas where women can effectively minister. You might be thinking, this sounds very chauvinistic. But Paul goes on to give his reason. Verse 13, for Adam was formed first, then Eve. Well, why did he stick that in there? What does it mean? The first reason for male authority in the church is order of creation. Adam, man, was created first and was given original authority on earth. Genesis chapter 2 says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Did you catch that? And the Lord God commanded the man. This command wasn't given to woman. At the time it was given, Eve had not yet been created for man. Therefore, Adam received his command and his authority from God. Eve received her command and her authority from Adam. Verse 14, and Adam was not deceived. But the woman, being deceived, fell into transgression. The second reason for male authority in the church is the difference in the sin of Adam and Eve. You see, both Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden. And Eve clearly sinned first. Yet the Bible never blames Eve for the human race's fall. It always blames Adam. Romans chapter 5 verse 12 tells us that through one man, sin entered the world. Through one man, sin entered the world. Adam is responsible because there was a difference of authority. Adam had an authority that Eve did not have. Therefore, he also had a responsibility that Eve did not have. Adam failed in his responsibility in a far more significant way than Eve did. This verse tells us that Adam was deceived. I'm sorry, that Eve was deceived and Adam was not deceived. Eve was tricked. Adam knew exactly what he was doing when he rebelled. This means that although Adam's sin was worse, Eve's ability to be more readily deceived made her more dangerous in a place of authority. In general, women seem to be more spiritually sensitive than men. But this can be true for good or for evil. Notice that Paul identifies Adam by name, but he says woman rather than Eve. He emphasizes the sex rather than the individual because he desires to give the incident its general application, especially in view of what follows. Verse 15, nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness. 
with self-control. Now the Greek word sozo, or saved, meaning the full orb of God's blessing, the woman will be saved in childbearing, does not refer only to the fact that they won't die bearing children, but that they will experience the full orb of God's blessing in raising children. Although there are exceptions, although there are women who are uniquely called to separate themselves for service to the Lord, the rule of thumb for the church is that women are to pour themselves into their kids, for there they will find their greatest blessing. If a woman must work, she should carefully make her job selection in such a way that her job does not in any way pull her emotions or her energy away from her family. You see, moms, by the time people come to me as a pastor, they've usually been beaten up by life. On the other hand, moms have the opportunity to love and shape fresh new lives that haven't yet been messed up by the world. Now, this is not a popular position, but look at our culture. We are paying the price for turning away from these very simple and basic premises. Everyone is trying to figure out why our kids have gone so awry. But God has already told us men should lead the church, women should lead the kids. So too is the bride of Christ. Where will I be saved? Where will I most fully experience God's blessing? In childbearing. There's no joy like that of seeing someone become born again. There's nothing like it. That's why Jesus said that when one sinner comes into the kingdom, there's a party in heaven. Luke chapter 15. Has it been a while since you shared the Lord with someone? If you've never led someone to Jesus Christ, you're missing out. For all of us will discover that the full orb of salvation is indeed found in seeing other people become born again. Now, we have some tracts available on the back table there, and they're available for you to take with you. They shouldn't just gather dust here in the church building in our literature rack. They should be taken home and passed out to the people whom the Lord brings across your path your teller at the bank, the wait staff at your favorite restaurant. Leave a good tip to, don't just leave a tract, leave a good tip, be a good witness. Perhaps a coworker, a friend, maybe even a random stranger. Each gospel tract has the potential to be used to change a human being's eternal destiny. That potential will not be fulfilled until you do your part and give it to someone. Go forth now and bear some spiritual children in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, thank you so much for your truth. Some parts are e easier to digest than others. Some parts sometimes might seem to rub us the wrong way. But truth is truth. And we make no apology for your truth. We embrace your truth. We celebrate your truth. And we ask you, Lord, to work within each one of us to show us how you would have us to serve you, how you would have us to share you with the lost and dying world around us. Oh, how we need your touch. Oh, how we need your power. Oh, how we need the movement of your Holy Spirit in and through our lives. So, Lord, we welcome you to take the reins and, and move us, Lord, wherever you wish. Fill us to overflowing with your spirit, Lord, and may it manifest itself in the love of Christ. Help us, Lord, to glorify you this day and every day, for you alone are worthy. In Jesus' name. Amen.
chapter. There's a little bit of tough stuff there, but that's one of the hallmarks of verse by verse teaching. You don't avoid the tough subjects when they come up. God hasn't given us that prerogative. We're not afraid to confront them. So now take what God has taught you this day and use it to further his kingdom. Isn't he good? Isn't he kind? Isn't he gracious and merciful and just and slow to anger and quick to forgive? Hasn't he poured out his grace on you? Yes. Hasn't he poured out his mercy upon you? Yes. Isn't he good? Amen. Amen. The Lord bless thee. The Lord bless thee. And keep thee. And keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee. And be gracious unto thee. And be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up, the Lord lift up his countenance, his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. May God richly bless you.